Welcome everyone to the Foreign Press Center. My name is Miranda Patterson, one of the media relations officers here at the Foreign Press Center. I am pleased to welcome Dr. Mira Rapp Hooper here in our FPC. The purpose of today's briefing is to preview the official visit of Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese to the United States. Dr. Mira Rapp Hooper is Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for East Asia and Oceania. She is a top White House advisor responsible for the Indo-Pacific strategy and other initiatives. A quick reminder of the ground rules for today. This briefing is on the record. After her opening remarks, Senior Director Rapp Hooper has kindly agreed to take questions. Please raise your hand and I will call on you. If called for a question, please begin your question by stating your name, outlet, and country. For our journalists joining via Zoom, if you have a question, please go to the participant field and virtually raise your hand. We will call on you and you can unmute yourself. And if you like, turn on your video to ask your question. You can also submit questions in the chat box. If you have not already done so, please take this time now to rename your Zoom profile with your full name and the name of your media outlet. This briefing, briefing will end promptly at 1 p.m. We will post a video and the transcript of this briefing afterwards on our website, which is fpc.state.gov. And with that, I'm going to turn this briefing over to Senior Director Rap Hooper. Thanks very much, Miranda. Um, and thanks to you all for being here with us this afternoon. It's great to have the opportunity to preview Prime Minister Anthony Albanese's visit to the White House. As you know, the President and First Lady look forward to welcoming Prime Minister Anthony Albanese and Ms. Jody Hayden to the White House tomorrow for an official visit and state dinner to celebrate the ever-expanding alliance between the United States and Australia. This will be the fourth foreign leader visit with a state dinner during the Biden administration and the ninth meeting between President Biden and Prime Minister Albanese since Prime Minister Albanese took office just about a year and a half ago. Since the beginning of the Biden-Harris administration, we have focused on strengthening our relationships with allies and partners globally, and especially in the Indo-Pacific. Australia is one of our oldest and closest allies in the region, and our two countries have stood side by side for more than 100 years. This state visit is a celebration of our partnership throughout the past century, and it's a commitment to facing the challenges and opportunities of the 21st century together. We have a rich shared history on the battlefield in defense of democracy, human rights, and rule of law. With this visit, the United States and Australia are strengthening our alliance to deliver for the Indo-Pacific in new and innovative ways. I'd like to start by highlighting a few key moments that we expect to happen this week, or a few key moments in some cases that have already happened. Um, as you may know, the Prime Minister and Ms. Hayden uh, arrived in DC on Sunday evening. On Monday, the Prime Minister laid a wreath at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier at Arlington National Cemetery. The Prime Minister then visited Microsoft, where the company announced an unprecedented $3 billion artificial intelligence and cybersecurity partnership with Australia. And yesterday, our two governments jointly launched the Critical Minerals Task Force at the White House to discuss bilateral cooperation to deliver sustainable, resilient, and secure critical minerals and clean energy supply chains to our two nations. Early this evening, the Prime Minister will participate in an opening ceremony for the newly renovated Embassy of Australia. And tomorrow morning, uh, the official program kicks off with President Biden officially welcoming Prime Minister Albanese with an official arrival ceremony with full honors, followed by a bilateral meeting, press conference, and state dinner. The Prime Minister will close out his visit to Washington with a state luncheon on Thursday, hosted by the Vice President and the Secretary of State. We believe this visit is an apt celebration of the U.S.-Australia alliance, past, present, and future, uh, and is especially important given the difficult moment that we are all living through internationally today. Australia has been and continues to be a fundamental partner in achieving our shared vision, vision of prosperity and stability around the world, and we have stood side by side in every conflict for the past 100 years. That remains especially important today in a moment of grave crisis. As like-minded democratic allies, the United States and Australia stand united in our condemnation of the attacks by Hamas and in our commitment to returning peace and stability to Gaza and Israel and to providing urgently needed humanitarian aid to those who need it. 
alongside his steady leadership in the wake of Hamas's horrific attacks on Israel and continued commitment to Ukraine, the president remains focused on the long-term stakes in the Indo-Pacific. Working closely with allies like Australia ensures that we can tackle these critical issues at once, managing the immediate challenges before us while also staying focused on the future. I'd now like to take a moment more just to highlight some of the key initiatives that we expect to announce tomorrow. Innovation will serve as the guiding principle as our two countries embark on a new phase of our bilateral relationship. Tomorrow, the two leaders will discuss and announce significant deliverables, including in some of the following areas. First, we'll have several announcements related to new technology cooperation, particularly on artificial intelligence, uh, and highlighting new cooperation on space issues. Second, we will have announcements related to clean energy uh, and the building of resilient, sustainable, and secure critical mineral supply chains, building on an important new compact that our leaders announced in May uh, and with the launch of our critical minerals task force uh, that has taken place over the course of the visit thus far. Tackling the climate crisis, including by mobilizing funding for businesses across the region, remains a priority for both of our leaders. We'll also talk about how we're advancing connectivity across the Pacific through major new investments in undersea cable infrastructure and in maritime infrastructure. President Biden and Prime Minister Albanese will discuss how they can enhance defense cooperation, including trilaterally with Japan, and to fully implement the AUKUS partnership. They'll touch on our deepening closer people-to-people -people ties, including between our indigenous communities. And while I don't uh, want to get ahead of the important concrete initiatives they will be announcing from the White House tomorrow, uh, I do want to say that we have a full slate of activities that span the broad range of the U.S.-Australia alliance that we look forward to being uh, able to announce tomorrow. I'll conclude today just by reiterating that this state visit will reflect our deeply intertwined histories and celebrates our ambitious shared vision of innovation for the future. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Um, we'll take questions now as a reminder. Please project, um, state your name and outlet. Yes. Um, thank you very much for doing the briefing. Um, Robert Delaney from uh, South China Morning Post, Hong Kong. Uh, so recently we've heard uh, several officials uh, from the Pentagon talking about uh, how uh, communication has broken down uh, with, uh, with China and uh, sort of in the absence of that uh, discussion, uh, between uh, military military dialogue, the uh, the U.S. the Pentagon has been reaching out to its p allies and partners in the Indo Pacific. Uh, Australia comes up uh, quite often uh, in these discussions, and uh, what we're hearing is that the uh, the Pentagon is sharing a lot of information about what they're learning from uh, operations by the PLA in the Indo Pacific. So, can you talk to us about to what extent? will uh, cooper military cooperation uh, with respect to uh, the, the uh, operations by the PLA in the South China Sea and East China Sea uh, and and more broadly in the Indo-Pacific or Western Pacific. Um, how much is this going to figure into the discussions between the two leaders? Thank you. Sure. I can say that every time President Biden and Prime Minister Albanese get together, um, they do discuss their broad agenda, including defense and security cooperation, for maintaining and upholding peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific. And of course, that includes in the East China Sea and South China Sea, where both of our countries have longstanding and stated interests um, in ensuring that peace and stability. Um, and in the South China Sea, uh, both have long held uh, commonly articulated positions on their support for international law, freedom of, of navigation. Um, and in particular, the UN uh, Convention on the Law of the Sea. Um, I have no doubt that the leaders will go deeper to talk about what is necessary to uphold peace and stability in the South China Sea, but I don't want to get ahead of their conversations. Okay, thank you. We'll take this question in the front before going online. Thank you. Uh, Ken Moriyasu from Nikkei Asia. Um, you talked about defense cooperation, uh, two aspects of what you said. Could you go a little bit deeper into the trilateral cooperation with Japan? And also uh, regarding AUKUS, um, uh, AUKUS kicks off at a time when U.S. shipyards have little capacity and there's bottlenecks uh, in the maintenance. Um, what kind of um, uh, discussions will take place on uh, producing submarines? Thank you. Um, again, I can't get ahead of our uh, important announcements tomorrow, so I'll be uh, relatively shorter on the particulars. Um, but I will say uh, that the United States and Australia, of course, have made strides in our trilateral cooperation with Japan, and we are excited to announce some 
concrete new initiatives um, tomorrow. That, of course, builds on a long history of trilateral cooperation with, with Japan and uh, strong trilateral or rather bilateral cooperation with each one of our countries in areas ranging from uh, reciprocal access to defense exercises to information sharing. Uh, so we'll have more to say tomorrow, um, but suffice it to say that uh, we remain very energized by the great co cooperation that's going on amongst Washington, Tokyo, and Canberra. Um, on the question of AUKUS um, and the preparedness of uh, the submarine industrial base, um, of course, um, you know, the United States and Australia are keenly focused on the fact uh, that AUKUS is a long-term initiative where we're going to have to make significant investments on both sides of the Pacific and in the UK um, in our industrial basis and in our preparedness um, to contribute uh, to this groundbreaking initiative. I do want to point to the fact um, that just last week when the president submitted his emergency supplemental proposal to Congress, uh, he included over $3 billion of supplemental submarine industrial base support uh, in that package, which is intended to boost exactly the industrial base that we are talking about. Um, this follows on a very generous contribution to our submarine in uh, industrial base by our Australian allies, who are making concrete investments in the United States' ability to produce submarines as part of the AUKUS partnership. OK, um, let's go to our Zoom participants. Farah, can you please unmute yourself? Yes. Thank you. Um, there is no question, as you say, uh, that both President Biden and Prime Minister Albanese are very focused on the situation in the Middle East, uh, intently so. But I think that an important piece of this visit is demonstrating to both our publics and indeed the world, all international audiences, um, that both of them also remain laser focused on the Indo-Pacific. And that in particular, by working together, it is possible for these leaders to do both things at once, um, to make sure that we are taking all necessary steps to uphold peace stability and prosperity um, in that critical region, even as we are focused um, on the conflict in the Middle East. Uh, so this visit, importantly, will be an opportunity for President Biden to engage with Prime Minister Albanese, not just on the Middle East or on Ukraine, uh, where Australia has been the largest non-NATO provider of military aid um, in a really significant set of contributions, but of course to discuss and move the ball forward on a wide range of Indo-Pacific areas of interest and initiatives, whether that's in the Pacific Islands, uh, in the South China Sea, or beyond. Um, so from our perspective, this is a really important moment to show the world um, that despite the fact uh, that there are significant conflicts uh, still in Europe and in the Middle East, uh, the president and his closest friends around the world are committed to the work they have on their plates in the Indo-Pacific as well. Uh, when it comes to the role of Congress in passing enabling legislation, um, of course, uh, we remain hopeful uh, and enthusiastic that Congress move um, at the quickest possible pace. As you noted, um, there are at least three key initiatives uh, that now sit with the Hill. Uh, that includes ship transfer legislation. Uh, it includes uh, export control streamlining legislation. And now it includes the supplementary budget request to include that submarine industrial base support. So I won't opine on the timeline along which I expect Congress to move. I don't claim to have that knowledge, uh, but I do expect that Prime Minister, Prime Minister Albanese and the president will discuss what they can do um, to further engage Capitol Hill to ensure that these critical pieces of legislation move forward expeditiously. Um, yes, we'll go here to Annalise. Please state your name again in your outlet. Um, Annalise Nielsen, Sky News Australia. And when it comes to the export controls, so the Australian side's announced that we're going to relax those restrictions so we can start participating. We're waiting on US Congress. The US government was able to fast track the, those same, same export control relaxations for Ukraine in a matter of days. C could we look at doing something similar for Australia, or is this just going to be a wait and see until Congress can do it? Uh, I'll say let's, uh, let's let the leaders have their conversation tomorrow, um, and I don't have much further for you on that at this time. I'm um, sorry, we're going the back to Jane. 
Jade McMillan, Australian Broadcasting Corporation. Just looking ahead to the state dinner tomorrow night, have arrangements been changed in any way given the situation in the Middle East? And secondly, will the two leaders specifically discuss the Prime Minister's upcoming trip to China? And if so, what would the message be from the President on that? Thank you. Um, on the question of state dinner arrangements, I'll leave that up to uh, my colleagues in the East Wing to opine on further. Um, Dr. Biden and her office have primary responsibility for the state dinner, um, but suffice it to say, um, the the event will meet the moment. Uh, but on the question of prospective to travel to China, um, I do expect the leaders uh, will talk about any uh, planned engagements uh, with the PRC. Uh, they do typically touch base every time they meet um, on uh, the role that China is playing in the region um, and compare notes on diplomacy. So I expect that this time will be no different um, across all manner of issues. Uh, we typically are deeply aligned with Australian friends. Um, and again, I uh, expect that will be the case here. Salia. Hi, I'm Leah Griffith with the Asahi Shimbun Japanese paper. My question is, do you expect discussions on the further cooperation of the Quad? We always have discussions on further cooperation of the Quad when any um, number of Quad leaders get together. Uh, it is a point of great pride uh, for each of our leaders in the United States, Australia, India, and Japan. Um, of course, Prime Minister Albanese has himself uh, been a tremendous leader in the Quad. Uh, you may recall that uh, when he uh, uh, surged to victory in his uh, own electoral contest about a year and a half ago, uh, he mentioned the Quad in his victory speech. He then actually uh, reordered uh, inaugural procedure to be sworn in uh, within 24 hours so that he could board a plane to Tokyo to attend uh, the Quad Summit that took place there. Um, and was also our host for the Quad Summit uh, in Hiroshima that took place in May. Um, so I have no doubt um, that we will discuss both President Biden and Prime Minister Albanese's continued vision for the Quad. Typically, when Quad leaders meet, they check in on the ongoing programs of work. Um, they set their sights higher for uh, what we might like to do to cooperate together in the future. Um, and they reiterate, reiterate their intent um, that the Quad, above all else, should be a partnership that delivers meaningfully for the Indo-Pacific, which, of course, um, is a mission that the U.S. and Australia, as well as all the Quad partners, are fundamentally committed to. Um, yes, we'll go to you here in the back. Yes, uh, my name is Hiro Watanabe, Sankei Shinbun. Uh, could you elaborate on a um, little bit uh, political mineral task force about its initiative? Uh, is it a bilateral base or other, uh, other allies like Japan or South Korea can be involved because um, here, um, the Asian countries are facing a common challenge. Uh, China dominates production and the so, 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 yeah. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, the initiative uh, at this point uh, remains bilateral. It was launched on a bilateral basis in May, uh, when again, our leaders agreed to an important new compact. Um, and the official task force uh, was just launched yesterday by our governments and today to include the private sector. The objective of the Critical Minerals Task Force is to deepen our cooperation to deliver sustainable, resilient, and secure critical minerals and clean energy supply chains to the world and to reduce global emissions. Um, and specifically, part of what we're interested in working on together is better facilitating cooperation between private sectors and governments to ensure um, that promising investments are uh, making their way to promising projects in both of our countries. Uh, the Critical Minerals Task Force that was launched this morning uh, included an opening set of very compelling remarks by Prime Minister Albanese uh, himself. And it was then co-chaired uh, by Madeline King, Min Minister King from Australia, and Secretary Gina Raimondo, um, our Secretary of Commerce. Um, so we do have quite a lot of energy behind this initiative. Um, certainly, the important work that we are doing is applicable beyond the bilateral relationship. Um, it's a key instance of what many of us like to call friend shoring, or perhaps in the US-Australia alliance, meet shoring, um, where we do our best to ensure uh, that these critical supply chains are supported as best they can amongst like-minded countries. Thank you. Okay, we'll go back to Jade. Yes. Jade McMillan, Australian ABC. The Australian government has announced that it won't be cancelling a Chinese company's 99-year lease for the Port of Darwin. 
What is the administration's view on that and will that be a topic of conversation between the two leaders? Uh, I don't have anything for you at this time um, on an administration position on the Port of Darwin announcement um, and can't get ahead of what our leaders may say tomorrow. Yes, go ahead. Can I do a follow-up on the critical minerals uh, agreement? Um, and I, I just, I mean, I understand you're, you're bringing um, uh, senior high-level officials like Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo to this, but I mean, mining really involves companies, uh, generally private companies. So will we see any um, uh, uh, company participation in the events uh, that, that, are, uh, that are scheduled for the next few days? There was significant private sector participation in the Critical Minerals Roundtable that was held at the Australian Embassy this morning. Got you. Thanks. We did have another question submitted online um, from a journalist in Malaysia, Manik Mehta, who asked about future expansion of the Quad and if that's in the discussions at all. Um, is the participant with us at the moment? They are not. Okay. Uh, so there are two ways to interpret the question. Uh, one would be expansion of membership. Uh, another would be expansion of projects or objectives. Um, on the question of expansion of membership, uh, that is unlikely, at least at this time. Uh, the quad leaders have agreed that they will remain a quad for the foreseeable future. Um, and that is because uh, they feel, we feel, we have important work cut out for us to perfect our model and show that we can really deliver for the Indo-Pacific. Um, it's a mission that all four countries share deeply. And every time our leaders meet, we get a little bit better uh, at our ability to provide practical solutions uh, for Indo-Pacific partners in areas that they care about, uh, whether that's on infrastructure, uh, new critical and emerging technology solutions like the open net RAN network that we're providing in Palau, or uh, maritime security, where we are providing new maritime domain awareness technology to Southeast Asia, the Pacific Islands, and South Asia. Um, but the Quad leaders are also very interested in engaging other Indo-Pacific partners. Uh, they've signaled on multiple occasions a strong interest in engaging deeply with and having a really productive relationship relationship with ASEAN countries, uh, who Quad leaders see as a natural partner. Um, and the Quad, of course, respects um, and is intended to reinforce ASEAN centrality. Um, there's also a strong desire uh, to engage in mo much closer cooperation with Pacific Island leaders. Uh, but when it comes to the question of expansion of Quad initiatives, perhaps, um, I think there's always room to grow. Uh, again, what we see every time the leaders meet is that they're focused on um, trying to deliver practical projects. Um, that will make a difference in the lives of Indo-Pacific partners um, and demonstrate that this group of like-minded democracies uh, really can deliver high standard solutions. Um, so just the way that the Quad started out uh, with its vaccine initiative, uh, moved on to launch a Quad fellowship, and then moved into the maritime domain awareness space, I think we will con continue to see the Quad innovate in its agenda every place there is an opportunity um, to show up for partners in the region. Thank you. Um, okay, we'll go back briefly um, to Farah with the Sydney Morning Herald. Please unmute yourself online. The supplementary budget request is uh, a request in its entirety. Uh, we are hopeful uh, that this piece uh, will move forward um, and that uh, the submar submarine industrial base request uh, will help us make the case for why the entire package is so important, uh, in no small part because, as you know, uh, there has been a lot of advocacy, a lot of interest uh, on both sides of the aisle in Congress uh, to ensure uh, that the U.S. submarine industrial base is properly supported. Um, so it is part of a broader package, uh, but again, we think that when it comes to our submarine industrial base, the strategic case for why this funding is important is clear, is understood on a bipartisan basis, um, and helps to make a holistic case for why emergency funding is needed uh, to support the United States and our allies and partners in three critical regions. Okay, did you have a... Yeah, sorry. Um, Nikki, uh, Ken, Ken Warren, asked from Nikki again. 
Uh, do you have any comments on um, the sacking of the Chinese defense minister, uh, whether this came as a surprise to the White House? I will uh, leave any comments on PRC government personnel to the PRC government. Sorry, Annalise from Sky News again. Are you expecting any discussion about, um, there's been a lot of reporting around Australian billionaire Anthony Pratt and his dealings with Donald Trump, um, about whether that's going to impact any national security concerns during the discussions? I don't have a uh, reason to believe that it will impact our leaders' conversations. Okay, do we have any additional questions in the room or online? Okay, just I'll one, leave it. Sorry, I just one more question. Um, Robert from South China Morning Post. Um, regarding the, uh, the Xiangshan Forum uh, in Beijing that starts next week, uh, will there be any discussions between um, uh, the Prime Minister and President uh, Biden about uh, Australia's participation in the forum uh, or anything about uh, the, the, uh, the objectives that uh, Australia's participation may have? I'm not tracking uh, that as part of the conversation necessarily at this time, but of course, if Australian friends uh, raise it, the president will will be ready to discuss. Thank you. Senior Director, do you have anything you'd like to conclude on? I think we're done with questions. Great. I'll, I'll um, simply wrap up by thanking you all for being here uh, today. Again, uh, you know, we're we're conscious of the fact uh, that this is a very grave moment of crisis in the Middle East, um, but do think uh, that as the president is laser focused on that challenge, uh, it is important to demonstrate, and indeed this visit is demonstrating, the importance of the Indo-Pacific um, and the ability of the United States alongside its closest allies to ma maintain focuses in multiple critical regions at once. Uh, that is, in fact, the entire theory of the case of the investments that President Biden has made in our closest allies and partners. Um, by sharing responsibility, by aligning our strategies, by aligning our policies, we can do more together. So that's exactly what the President and Prime Minister Albanese will be doing tomorrow. Thank you. And this concludes our briefing. I want to give a special thanks to our briefer, Senior Director Rap Hooper, for sharing her time with us today and to those who participated. You can find the transcripts online at fpc.state.gov. Thank you.